I'm here with Stephen Boll, who is from Copper Biological Systems. Uh, obviously, the, the producer of some of these beneficial that we see, uh, as well as uh, pollinators. So, what can you tell me about your products and, and why they contribute to <coughs> greenhouse sustainability? Well, we produce a whole range of products which uh, can be used either for pollination. So, when we talk about the bumblebees here, uh, they are used for pollination. In the past, uh, the growers had to spray uh, with hormones uh, to, uh, to get the tomatoes on and later tap them. But now the bumblebees do that for them. So it's clean, it's, so they're working all day long. And then we have a whole range of beneficial insects and predators, mites, wasps. So you have reduced labor because you're not applying the chemicals, you're not pollinating. Exactly. But then you also have uh, reduced chemical usage. Reduce chemical uh, usage, which for a little, we talk now about tomatoes, uh, we talk about something you could eat, and then it's important that there are no residues on it. But we also find, for instance, when we talk about floriculture, our products are also used. And then we see another uh, very big advantage, and then when you don't have to spray so much anymore, you see much higher productions because we say every spray costs maybe 10% or 5% production. So when you don't have to spray so much anymore, we see much better growth of a plant. Okay. and you get more production. So it's also for the profitability of the grower, it's beneficial. It seems like for a lot of growers, at least in the States, there's a bit of a hurdle to overcome when applying biological control. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not a hurdle, but a barrier in their own mind. Yeah. Um, how might you address that to a grower who's considering it and, and maybe how to over overcome some of those challenges, whether they're real or perceived? I think the biggest hurdle to overcome is uh, to make sure that you visit the grower all the time and you can, uh, you can help him see what's going on eh? because it's a lot of psychological fear about uh, uh, if I don't spray anymore then the pest will go out of control. But yeah, seeing is believing so doing it and, and showing it to the grower that it works I think that's in the end that's the best way. Now you have some examples of some products here. Yeah. Can you talk about them a little bit? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. Uh, here we have some uh, cards. Uh, these little cards contain uh, uh, these yellow and black speckles and they are parasitized white fly pupae. Okay. So it's the same what happens in the crop. So we stick about 60 of those pupae on a cart and we glue them on it and the grower can just, uh, he can just uh, hang it in the crop like this and then uh, over a period of time little wasps emerge, they start searching the crop, they look for white fly pupae and they lay an egg on it and then it will turn either black or yellow depending on the, on the species of parasite. This is Encarja formosa and Eretmosa ceramicus, two species where there are no common names for which parasitize whitefly. Okay. And in this little box, we call it an introduction box, it contains a little mirrored box, a predator of a wide range of pests. Okay. So they eat whitefly, but they also eat spider mites, aphids, or for instance, which is a common pest in the summertime, caterpillars. This is actually the most, uh, yeah, the, the, the best product for a grower. They also, also always want something that eats everything. Right. Well, it's getting it's close as to close it. As you can yeah, get. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, I also wanted to ask you about efforts that you say are underway to do, to develop a biological control for pests that might be in the media. Yeah. What can you tell me about that? Yeah. Well, since the last uh, few years, Copert is also working on uh, on a new uh, way. Uh, to also do not only biological control above the ground, but also underneath the ground okay. or in the substrate, in the, in the rock wool substrate. And uh, normally when you grow in the soil, there are all sort of uh, beneficial insects around the root zone. Uh, there are fungi, uh, there are also uh, all sort of microbes, bacteria, mm -hmm. flagellates, nematodes, you name it. And they're all playing a role in the root zone. And, but in, in, uh, when the growers started to grow, not in the soil anymore, but in uh, rock wool, uh, there was a total different concept. We thought we have to keep it totally clean, then we have no pests and diseases in the root zone. But it seems that when you keep it almost clean, that the few fungi that get in there, they're always very pathogenic okay. and they can attack the roots. Uh, so. Now we are restoring the life around the root zone and to make the plant less vulnerable for uh, patho pathogens, eh, for fungi attacking it or for bacteria. Uh, and, and, 
and so what we're doing is not really applying uh, fungi to the root zone or bacteria. No, we are uh, applying the food uh, for these fungi okay. to grow on. The and we beneficial measure fungi, basically. Huh? The beneficial fungi. The beneficial fungi, okay. yes. So we have some products also, fungi we apply, but more we stimulate the, the, the natural activity in the root zone.